Uh, so hello and welcome back. This is Colin Keeley here. And I'm Brent Sanders. And we are two guys buying and building wonderful internet companies. Yes, indeed. And so this week, Colin went deep on another, I don't know, luminary of private equity or software private equity field. He did a profile on Joe Lyman, who's the billionaire founder and CEO of Trilogy Software and ESW Capital, which is short for enterprise software, ESW. I guess that makes sense which is a holding company that just buys software companies, which is similar to what we're trying to to achieve here, just on a, a smaller scale, at least to start. I guess the first question is, is where did you find this guy? Joe Lyman, he's, I've never heard of him. I think most of our listeners probably never heard of him. What was the, the inspiration for going deep on some kind of unknown hidden figure? So I did this a long time ago and I forgot I did it because I wrote it in Evernote. So my initial thought was, you have Andrew Wilkinson, who's trying to brand himself as like the good guy. And Joe Lyman is like the dark force in software and very mm. quiet and guts companies, keeps like the software contracts and nothing else. So I initially wrote a post in Evernote where it was comparing the two of them and how they have different approaches. And I just completely forgot I did it. Uh, so people were you asking me- you do this me, that much that you're just like forgetting about all this work? Yeah, I take a lot of notes on stuff. So I read, I think a profile on them and I took notes on it. And I just, I didn't remember I had it looking through my notes and everyone's asked me like, what are you going to do after Robert F. Smith? And I was like, I don't really have any plan for any others. And I guess little did I know I forgot I did one. So there I just had to clean it up this week. What was the, like, how did you find this guy? Like, how do you know he even exists? I think there was a Forbes profile on him maybe three years ago, since I started writing it like two years ago. Right. And so he was famous in the 90s on par with Bill Gates. So sure. he was like this wonder kid. He was on the, the cover of Forbes and he had Trilogy software. So Trilogy is like product configuration and sales software. And it was targeted towards big enterprise companies. So like the product wasn't well known in the space, but they were really well known for recruiting and for having a crazy culture. So they were on par with Microsoft and eBay for trying to get like the young talent out of universities. And they were, had this like testosterone fueled, alcohol infused, like long parties, hard hours. <laughs> like they were the bad boys. And as you think of Uber in the early days, like they were the original bro culture tech startup kind of guy. Interesting. That's a, I don't even know what to think about that. Cause it's their booze definitely helps programming for like the first drink in a quarter or so there's like a, I think it's called the Balmer peak where you get one beer in you and you, you all of a sudden these ideas come to you and you start working faster and better but it definitely goes downhill pretty quick and I just can't imagine programmers partying or sorry paid like rock stars and party like them so I guess it, this is uh assuming this was all in the Bay Area this was like the beginning and this is 1990 what three, five, something like that. So he dropped out of Stanford in 1990 at age, and he very, I don't know when, but he very quickly moved to Austin. So him cool. and Michael Dell, like basically founded Austin Tech a uh, mm. long time ago. And so the whole alcohol thing, it's basically because they were recruiting all these smart engineers directly out of college, hire attractive women to recruit them. And then they try to have like that college kind of campus experience of like still drinking. This is where the cool kids are. And it was uh, mostly a recruiting tactic. And they became pretty famous for that. And like uh, Bill Gates would talk about who are you afraid of losing people to? And it's all trilogy software. They're getting yeah. all the good recruits. So the, their first product's a, it's something they, they made themselves. And this is, this, so this is all before uh, the more structured fund. So they have a product that's for configurating things, but configurating configuring product. Sorry, we got to, I don't know why that word configure eight. I don't think configure eight is a thing. <laughs> I built a configurator once and the, the client kept calling it a configurator. Uh, now it's like in my, my mind anyways. So they have this product They're They're up there with the nineties, like stars of tech. And what happens next? So they, they end up selling this business quickly. It was a rocket ship. It hit 120 million in sales within six mm. years. He was the youngest self-made person on Forbes 400 with a half a billion dollars in net worth. And then much of his initial wealth came from spinning off PCOrder.com, which sold you know, thousands of computer parts on the internet. Hmm. And that went public in 1999. And uh, Trilogy owned most of it. Uh, he sold $124 million in stock of it. And then he tried to do other things and nothing worked out before the dot-com bubble popped. Yeah. And Trilogy never went public before that time. 
he dropped off the Forbes 400 list. He stopped doing press interviews, which he was famous for. And he hasn't really has done, done one since, which is over 20 years ago. He outsourced all of Tri Trilogy's US workforce and he took the company private. Um, and so you haven't really heard anything since. Hmm. And so with that like kind of war chest that he had, he still had those software contracts that are still profitable. And he basically became a patent troll. So he like would buy up dying software companies that still had these like patent war chests suing the big names, Sun Microsystems, Sears, Toyota for infringing on Trilogy and other software patents. And that's where he made enough money that he could start doing some more interesting acquisitions. Interesting. Yeah. So he, he made some money. I guess the question is, did he make more money from patent trolling or from his first business and investments? I'm trying to wonder if maybe that's the right business to be getting in. <laughs> so he definitely made some, I would say on the scale of a hundred million, at least, I would say he still retained after everything came crashing down. And then he bought up these things to do patent trolls. And that was very successful. He had some that were settlements for $390 million. Hmm. So a pretty big war chest from there. And almost all this is his own money. Like I don't, my understanding is that ESW today is basically a family office. Like it is, it is just his capital. And it's like something like $3 billion yeah. on that scale. With everything, I'm just trying to think back to 2000, right? So there's a market crash. Everybody hates tech. Nobody wants to invest in it. Or at least from you know a public market perspective, it, it was egg on the face of the tech world. And so it probably makes sense to, to go dark, right? It's like no one, the, the public has decided what they think about this whole category. And so what's the point of being a, a character within that or a role within that world? So he goes dark. He probably knows you have to think about it. If you're a player in this space, who owns what, what evolutions other companies have done. And it looks like you, you were saying he ultimately settled with a, a big judgment against SAP, the, the giant German software giant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did he keep going down that route or is it like he, he won this big one and that was like, okay, I got my, that, that game's over. And, and now I'm on to buying and consolidating software companies. Uh, so the way it's phrased is he had long admired uh, Charles Wang of Computer Associates is like the OG. That's the yeah. original kind of software roll-up company uh, before Mark Leonard, before anyone else that you know, or we've talked about. And so that guy became a billionaire by methodically buying up enterprise software companies, including Lehman's Fathers in 1987. So Lehman's father uh, he comes from a line of like successful business people. They would take vacations with so the famous Jack Welch from GE. And so he was always deep into business and he started Trilogy with the goal of being a company that like Jack Welch or his father would want to buy and talked about that was his idea all along, but it's unclear because he didn't really start buying up software companies until like 2006. This is so funny because I could have sworn you just said Forbes said he was a self-made millionaire but he's vacationing, his, his family's vacationing with Welch's. So I guess, I don't know, does self-made mean you have to come from meager or conservative? Or, you know what I mean? Like you, you're not born into wealth. I thought that's what self-made meant. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how you define it. He was a kid when he started it. So did he, so did he have uh, any money? No. He had all the like family connections you could want. Call Uncle did. Jack and see how you deal with a difficult situation. Yeah. What do you think <laughs> self-made means? I, I don't know. Like, what are the Kardashians self-made? Self I mean, yeah, I don't know. Are they, are they considered to be right? The, the, was it Kylie Jenner? They said she was self-made and then people got all up in arms about it. And everyone's offended about everything nowadays, but I was just curious. It's super interesting that if you vacation with the Welches at dinner time, you come away with a philosophy. You, you talk about how management styles and, and for anybody who's listening, I'm assuming, you know, who Jack Welch is, um, the, the legendary is, is compass and is the executive from GE who grew it to what it, it was once, I guess I shouldn't say what it is now. It is no longer, but he was famous. And I think there's some really interesting, you know, ways in which he thought about personnel, right? He had his stars was the top 10 or 15% of people that you pay them anything they want. And then you have the middle, what, 70% that they get a 3% raise a year and that's it. And they don't really get to call the shots. And then anything below that, you're just turning out. And there's this, you know, very methodical way of thinking about people and in GE, it's different. It's not pure software. And so I'm just curious, or I think it's really interesting that they, there is a connection there because I, I think of Jack Welch as somebody who's a 
ruthless pragmatists, something like being able to just say, hey, it just doesn't make sense to have all these people. We're going to cut it. And especially in software where it's not as human capital intensive necessarily. Yes. So Joe Lyman's whole thing is basically uh, you need a very talented engineer to make the first Ferrari, to design mm-hmm. the first Ferrari. And then you just need really a mechanic to do like oil changes and to keep things mm-hmm. running. And that is effectively how he runs ESW Capital and all his enterprise software companies. It is, that, it is interesting and it makes sense, right? For for certain profiles, I'm talk about some of the companies they took in. The one thing that strikes me is that what happens, like how do you still compete with your competitors in the space? So maybe you choose businesses that like we talk about on this podcast a lot where it's like harbor management software, like very specific and you're going to be the one player and there isn't much research and development that you need to put into this space. You just build the product and people use it and they're happy and they're going to be lifelong subscribers versus more consumer products where, right, you have to constantly be adding features and getting people excited about it. And so maybe that's part of their thesis is just finding things that are, they don't need changes. And I guess, obviously it works for them. Yeah. So I would say it's fairly different than what we're doing. Theirs is definitely like the older, the better. I would say Mm -hmm. if you still are like in the fairly early days, you're not just buying purely enterprise software contracts. It's like, well, this is going fairly well, but there's also these adjacent markets that are really interesting. Like you need more creative, more talented people to do new stuff and move to adjacent markets. Mm -hmm. If all you're trying to do is service enterprise software contracts, not really change anything, which is more of what this is. It's more like cigar butts, um, which is a Warren Buffett term of just like buying old businesses that cash flow. And it's unclear how much is like, like life is left in them. Uh, but if you just cut costs, you could make a lot of profit, which is more of his approach here. Yeah. Yeah. You basically, as you, as we've looked at you have some of these companies where there are 10, 20 person teams and they're working on new features and you could see a world where it's like, Hey, if we just froze the product where it is, you can take a team of 10 to a team of one, or not even, you just have a, you know, as you said, a, a so, or sort of a maintainer that can come in on a quarterly basis and just make sure everything's running because it, depending on the software, it, that's completely viable. And that's the beauty of software versus like other types of businesses is you can realistically run them with one or two or just a couple engineers. He comes in, guts the team. What happens to marketing? So you're gutting the software team, but is, is that also true for the other sort of capacities in a company? So I have to say, I know much less about Joe than I do some of the others because of the way he's operating. It's not, it's not a great way to operate. People don't love it. And so he's super quiet about it. So being a patent troll, not doing a press (laughs) and talking a lot about that, buying American companies, firing all Americans and moving people abroad, not a great reputation on that one either. So there is not a lot of great stuff out there on him. What I've seen is talking about getting rid of engineers. So I haven't seen that much about sales and marketing. I can talk about their general process and I think it applies to everyone but I I know at least it applies to engineers. So one of the things I've been thinking about as we look at deals week to week is we really talk to a lot of companies that are in good shape, but the reason they're selling is just something underlying is broken, right? And this has less to do with Joe Lyman or really any of the the folks we're talking about, but it's this idea that when you sell, you create an opportunity to shake the Etch-A-Sketch or, or, you know, redeal out the cards recap the company essentially where we've talked to companies where from everything from investors to partners. And there's just, there's just a, I don't want to say dysfunction. That's not the right word, but maybe some incongruencies across a team. And and then when you sell, you can wipe that slate clean and rebuild from beginning. And, And now you have a product that's already built in a business and it's a much different model. So I, I don't like, I'm not into necessarily this approach, but I totally get it because it's like, Hey, you already have your customers. We have a run rate. We have everything established. You just don't need the tech side of this necessarily. If you want to just reposition, because that's the opportunity you have when you sell your business or when you buy a business, it's just a new perspective on a different state and you can chart a new course. So I guess it's, it's fair. And that's, I can't really say, Oh, that's not a good way to do it. It's, it's clearly working for them. I'm not saying it's what we do, but I would also say we're not typically buying companies that we're, 
I shouldn't say this for a blanket statement, but we typically are going to do something with those companies. We're going to either continue on the current path or the current trajectory, which means don't touch the team, let them do their thing. If you're growing 50% year over year, you don't want to come in and, and try to squeeze out another 10, 20% with a new team or cutting costs. It's like trying to, to be overly dynamic. That seems foolish. But if you're the profile of this company is, it's basically on auto autopilot. We have 10 engineers that have been here for 10 years and they aren't necessarily getting a lot done. And they've been here for 10 years and the culture is such that we don't fire people or we don't do that sort of Jack Welch constant churn, the bottom 20% always churning out. You get to wipe the slate clean and implement some of these. I wouldn't say these are best practices, but they sure are working pretty well for Lehman and ESW. Yeah, I don't love his approach, but I do think he's super forward looking. So he was way ahead of the times on like remote work. And so surprise, if you could do your you know, job from home, there's also people around the world that will do your job for 80% less in that same job. So you're competing with way more people. And I think he saw that and discovered that a little earlier than everyone else. And I don't have it in this article, but the other thing he's been talking about recently is more automation. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of CEOs harbored this feeling of my bi biggest expense is all these people. Do I re really need them all? Or can this be you know, automated? So his thing was he was scolding everyone, like all his lieutenants in 2021. Like we have to itemize or compartmentalize, basically break everyone's do jobs down into smaller pieces mm -hmm. and then get narrowed down. Can this be done by a different human and just like really narrow in on that one uh, like assembly line style, or can this be done by a machine or a robot? I, I didn't include that in the article because it's harder to get sources on it, but that's been the rumors and things have been leaking out that he's really pushing his team to focus on that more. That's sensible. We've started an automation company. We've been into that that space and, and know that's the future. Like, I think that's been our, our general motivation behind it has been, we know that this is going to happen and everyone's going to converge on that. So it's interesting to hear his interest in it because I guess there, there are two ways to, to look at a business when you buy it. You can either cut costs. You can do both things, right? So I guess there's three or a blend of all these things, but it's either cut costs or invest and invest in, in, in this case, invest in product, right? Invest in like a software. We're going to add features. We're going to uh, push in marketing. We're going to do something to the product. And so it, it feels like very one-sided. However, again, it goes back to if the profile of these companies are such that they're, they already have a built-in customer base and they're mildly profitable currently, but there's a way to automate. Let me phrase it another way. If we start a fund tomorrow and our thesis was we just buy existing companies and just automate everything, that's very similar to ESW. Right. Automation, every practitioner is going to say, oh, we're going to, we're going to retool all those people. It's, yeah, it's bullshit. Like you're, the inspiration is to cost cut. That's like the most fundamental part of automation. And I, I don't think anybody will really deny that in the automation space. We are trying to you know, cost cut or create efficiency or free people up to do more people work. But at the end of the day, it's the same approach. And it seems like a new tool or not really a new tool, but a, a tool that's getting stronger and, and more prevalent that this perspective would likely yield or wield, I should say, in, uh, in their companies. Yeah. It seems like a natural progression of the path that they've already chosen to run. It if that's a, I think of this all as a spectrum. So like Vista equity, more high growth stuff, probably mm -hmm. not a great fit for that. If your plan is you know, just push on sales, push on like growing, like your costs don't matter a ton. Vista definitely has cost cutting components, but it's more so grow like Mark Leonard and Andrew Wilkinson are in a similar boat where it's grow, but like more at a, a reasonable pace and cost cut. But again, a much more reasonable pace, keep the teams in place. ESW is like cost cut to the bone, which is a pretty radically different approach and is a better fit for different types of companies. Yeah. Yeah. So as it relates to ESW, it sounds like these aren't, and, and, and as we've been exploring in, in our deals, it's like, we're just trying to do asset purchases, but they're not so much looking for that. They're looking to acquire the whole company. Yes. Which seems so odd. It's a unique. So their structure, which also makes researching this really hard, is it's all under a bunch of different names. So for the like simplicity of the article, I said it's just ESW, but it's actually done under a bunch of different things. Mm. So it's harder to track this. Wall Street Journal did a big report on it. Uh, so they are buying up bankrupt businesses, often that are venture back, that raise a, a boatload of money, never really made any revenue. So they have one example of security first 
that raised something like $150 million, they only ever made like $92,000. So somewhere out there, they have $150 million in losses in taxes or potential tax breaks that are available. And so ESW made an offer for the company around $6 million. And so it sounds like they got it. And with that, if they have profits to offset it, this could be $150 million in you know, tax break benefit to them, which is pretty unique and uh, a huge benefit of having this holding company approach where you have you know, profits to offset these tax losses. Okay. I love it. I love the, the creativity here, but let's figure out number one, how do you even, if you buy a company, you basically, so you buy a company that's has 150 million in debt, you buy it for 6 million. So there, how do you then start funneling your, oh, not debt. So if you think of a profit and loss, they had almost no revenue and they had a bunch of expenses, right? Cause they burned right. through that 140, $150 million somehow. So they have how negative you- with the IRS. Okay. So then they buy the company. And so they essentially put that on their balance sheet. They put that ledger entry of basically negative 150, and then they can offset their plus 150 and then owe no taxes in, in that mm-hmm. case. And there's no really no way of knowing how this actually plays out though, right? Yes. Cause it's all private. Uh, so only the IRS knows how successful it is, but yeah, you could go back and use your previous tax losses to offset your future tax burden. But it, mm-hmm. it's only good for a few years. I know Trump right. is famous for doing this, where he like paid no taxes because he had some huge loss like 10, 20 years ago that he kept bringing forward. Got it. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. I, they're playing all the games. They're, I shouldn't even call them games. These are strategies that seem like they're, there's, they're not like ashamed to, to play the game, right? There's no, it's a private company too. So it's rare for someone to even know about this. Yeah, it's all private. Uh, just to take one to the extreme, I uh, like one of their largest acquisitions, or the largest public one I've seen is called Jive. They bought it for 462 million in 2017. It was based in Portland and it had 250 employees at the time. And through a mixture of buyouts, layoffs, and voluntary exits, nearly all those employees were gone within a year. Wow. Uh, and less than a dozen remain as contract employees working from home. So that's their big prestigious you know, acquisition. And they just ran the playbook completely where they moved all the employees to like a, a global wage, they call it. Mm. C++ programmers should be like $15 an hour. Yeah. Yeah. What's their profile? I would assume based on what we've talked about so far, these are companies that have an established product, like track record is going to be everything, um, churn, low churn very stable. You want to find these like big turtles that are just plodding along. Yeah. So they actually integrate than other ones. So they buy these uh, companies. They basically effectively fire everyone or you know, close to it. They have crossover, which is an arm that handles recruiting for all these companies. So that like manages 5,000 plus employees. And then as far as what happens to the product, They roll it all together often, not always, but into like Netflix style software library subscriptions. Mm. So this is, it keeps adding benefits to their customers and then you cross sell the products effectively. So like you could have a library of software for marketing or library of software for like enterprise integrations or other business essentials. So you get a value on the upside as well, that cross selling. That's great. So it's all connected, right? So they, they have their portfolio and then you're looking at, yeah, I'm looking at some of the companies in your article here. See, you have a list. How did you find this list of companies, especially because there's all these different names that they're doing business under? I got one of their decks that they send to prospective founders that they're trying to buy from. And huh. it's like kind of the terms and different stuff like that. And so I, it was a bit of a question of this seems pretty bad, right? You're going to fire all your employees that you've spent you know, day in, day out, like years building a company together with. Why are founders selling to them versus a friendlier PE buyer? And so the reason is it's quick cash and good valuations. So they're very founder friendly, not employee friendly, but founder friendly and no earnouts or contingencies, IOIs with valuation within a week and LOI and closing within 45 days. And then 98% of LOIs close. So all this wow. was in that, the PDF where it's Dang. like, that, yeah. So there is, these are not competitive offers. They're just coming in with a boatload of cash. And they're ready to close right away. 
pretty much. They have all the cash <laughs> they need. The one thing they do that's like a little slimy. So they have this playbook that they developed in 2021. So it seems like they slowed down in acquisitions in 2019, didn't really do any in 2020. And then for some reason, again, this is like the opaqueness of it makes it hard, but they really pushed on the gas in 2021. And their goal was to do an acquisition per week. And they started farming it out and have a big team on it. And so they started doing exploding offers where it's like, hey, this offer is good. It's super juicy, but it's only good for two days. And they don't <laughs> actually hold them to that, but it's like trying to pressure CEOs to take it. Oh man, this is like a Glen Gary, Glenn Ross. I'm just picturing like a bunch of guys in a, an office cold calling companies. And I've got the opportunity of a lifetime for you, but it's a limited time offer. It feels very telemarkety. Looking at these businesses, it's actually really interesting. So first of all, did you just find the deck online or do you find it? Do you have a mole? I don't have a mole. I like to be my mole and listening in. Feel free to reach out. <laughs> So it's interesting. I'm looking at the, the list engine yard, which is a like a Ruby hosting platform that kind of sits on AWS. Some of these are ignite. I'm aware of jive, which was like an, I thought was like an open source. Like it, it's like Slack before Slack jive was, I believe you could do chat rooms and, and all sorts of stuff. This was like in the early two thousands. I remember it from, but it's not like they do just like Microsoft or anything. It seems like they're just grabbing categories of what do you need in your business and, and what are the, and so I'm looking at different ERPs for retail, for specific development and software tools. So the, obviously software is the, the first thing, but then as I'm looking into these kind of niches of application development, mobile development, it does seem like a fair amount of like software, like the end consumer is a software company, right? Like you're selling tools you're selling software tools to builders or creators. So that is a really interesting, and that we've been looking at deals in a similar space of like, you're selling sort of these pickaxes, you're trying to, you know, enable people to, to grow their businesses. So I was expecting it to be a little bit more like more like a Zoho, right? When you were explaining, oh, they want to be able to cross sell things. So I, I see some of these categories coming out though, in, in how some of these businesses are, are decided upon. But I guess the other part of it is, there's the commonality is these are all founders or owners that said, yes, it's like these people were all in a position, which I think is also, as everyone has their thesis, they're, they're looking at a very specific thing and they want to see the right things. That's also like the key part of this is just having somebody at the right time when they want to uh, move on. And so I guess, are they looking for these companies that they're buying? They're obviously, they're not public companies, but they're larger software companies that have likely had some sort of venture funding. And so this is like the first liquidation event for these companies. Do you have any idea, of, as I'm looking at these names, I'm not really sure, you know, I don't know their stories. I know about some of them and what they do, but I'm curious, like, who do they go after and what's the profile of the person that says yes to their deal? Yeah, so it is more flexible than I would have guessed from the outside. So it leaked out, so they have this playbook now for outbound emailing, outbound drip campaigns, and then cold calling. So they're like semi-scripted. And then everyone is judged on everything. So if your calls aren't going very good, you have to go to coach's corner and you get coached to have uh, better calls. With. But then what are they looking for? They have a hundred point like scorecard that they fill out for each of these companies. And so I have some of it, not all of it, but industry. So it's 25 points for software, 10 points for IT services. So they are buying IT services is not purely software stuff, which is surprising. LinkedIn headcount growth. So 10 points for a greater than 15% quartile decline or minus 20 points for greater than 30% annual growth. So avoiding things that are growing quickly. Location, 25 points for the US, 10 points for Canada, the UK. We've experienced this. Europe is mm -hmm. a, a little inconvenient. Debt, five points if there's leverage, founding date. So more points if it's older. Last fundraise, you get points if it's further back. So mm -hmm. all this is incorporating an idea that anything that raised recently or is growing super fast is unlikely to sell cheaply, which is what they're after. Or fit their playbook. Like that's the other thing is if you come into a company like that and then got the team, that growth is going to end. Yes. Yeah. That's the thing I'm keying in on is it seems like these are all companies and I'm assuming that's also just, I guess it's not a, a truth for all acquirers. A, why would you sell a business if you're in the thick of growth? And B, which as I think through, I guess there are situations. But as I look at this list of companies, it, it looks like companies that they figured it out. They got to a point where they started to juice their profitability. I'm thinking of Engine Yard in specific. This is a company 
started around when Blink Sale started, right? Around 10, maybe a little bit longer ago when Ruby and Rails was like first really taking over the internet. People started using it as a platform. They were a hosting platform for that stack specifically, but they ended up growing and, and building on upon that. And it's like, they had enough time to figure out what their offering was, figure out their user base. And then, yeah, having somebody come in and rebuild the business to just sustain, but with external, or I should say like cost effective labor. Yeah. Makes a the ton other, of sense. The other thing I would say is, so they have this prospecting going on. Their other hunting ground is like bankrupt companies about they've bought, I think at least 10 of them and at least three of them in 2020. Mm -hmm. And that's public. Uh, so bankruptcy court is public and you can see who's making offers and stuff. And so it's like immediately huge benefit because they're able to acquire stuff for a few million bucks and get a monstrous uh, tax deductions from it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what to think about that. I don't have much of an opinion. I guess all, it's, it's fair. It's definitely the, when we talk about slimy or these methods, it's, it's all fair. These are all like acceptable answers. It's not unethical either. I don't really think it's begging the larger question. If you think firing people is unethical, but it, you're definitely using all the unpopular methods. I think I always think of this as like the profile of a person that like goes to the craps table. I don't know if you craps or play craps, but there's the, the pass line, which everybody generally plays. And then there's the do not pass line, which means the game's over and you're basically betting against everybody. And it's just, I'm picturing this guy as walking into a casino with a whole bunch of chips and everyone's playing and everyone's playing and everyone's on the pass line. And every time the dice gets thrown, everyone's winning money. <laughs> and then he drops a bunch of coins on the do not pass line and is all of a sudden there's silence. Everyone's looking at him, but it's, you're allowed to play that. It's playing the game. It's you're allowed. The do not pass line exists. It's like shorting stocks. It's not, it's not very popular in a party like setting, but I'd love to see. So this guy does not go in public. He doesn't do interviews anymore. He's off the radar. When was the last time anybody's seen or heard from him? Does he do speaking? Does he do anything where we get a glimpse for how, how he looks at the world? I haven't seen a single thing. So everyone else, like Andrew Wilkinson's on podcasts every week, you see him all the time. Robert F. Smith was on a podcast this year, which is rare, but he's a billionaire and like still doing stuff. Mark Leonard, super press shy, but still writes like a lengthy annual letter. So you get a pretty good insight into this business. This guy does nothing. Uh, like the most recent photo I could find from him was in 2012, like not a single thread anywhere on anything else, like some of the stuff, like the playbook leaks out and you could read up on some of it, but he has a Lieutenant that runs the recruiting arm called crossover. Andy Triba He's also the CEO of 12 of the companies And this guy does interviews. And so you can go on YouTube, Google his name, Andy Triba, uh, a bunch of interviews with 50 views. So people just aren't paying attention to it, but that is like the only insight that I found into kind of how this whole thing is operating. Very cool. Very cool. I, I like that. I like this guy has a sort of a, a lightning rod. It, it, it just, I don't know, when the story has mystery, it's so much cooler, right? This guy just has <laughs> so much like shrouded, you know, anytime somebody could potentially be a Bond villain as well. I, I always like that, you know, where you don't know of him, but like the inner circle, they, they know him and they fear him or not either way. What he might be a really nice guy. And that's why he doesn't like to do interviews, but my guess is he is not right. If you're if this is your philosophy, you're probably also not that empathetic. You're probably not, or have like a philosophy that is maybe more warlike, some Machiavellian, something along those lines. But I guess if he doesn't, he, maybe he just needs to come on our podcast and tell us a little bit more about his philosophies of life. Yeah, he's definitely, I don't know, the dark cloud, the dark matter, where he's just mm -hmm. like vacuuming up software companies and they're never to be seen again. Like you never mm -hmm. get updates on them. Uh, Andy Triba is like Lieutenant is like a very polished executive. And so one of the darker things that they do is actually it's similar on Upwork, where if you hire Upworkers or contractors, they'll have spyware on people's computers. They'll track like their clicks and their keyboard strokes. And then I'll take a screenshot of their webcam, like every few minutes or something like that. And Andy Triba is great at spinning. This is like, it's a Fitbit for work. It's <laughs> It's just a way to empower workers to better analyze how they are spending. And it's unclear how often all that stuff is enabled, but that's what comes out is like, these are technology sweatshops, like global computer sweatshops and everything is monitored perfectly and people get fired at a very high rate. Yeah. I, I have to admit, I love the, that Upwork feature. 
And I, since I'm like a newly converted Upwork user, it is really nice to not have to ask people like, hey, where are you at on like between commits or whatever? It's, you can just see, and it reminds me, it's the remote equivalent of being in an office together. You can see over someone's shoulder and check and see, hey, I saw you were working on this for an hour. Do you need any help? What's going on there? That I can't imagine people go back and try to improve their time. They were there. They probably knew what they were doing. But yeah, it, it's... I, it's spyware, what, what do they call it? Process mining software. That's probably what they'll use it for next. That's like the RPA sort of automation tool where you install all these software pieces to measure. Okay, here's the pattern of clicks that we could start automating because Jan in accounting does the same 12 clicks every morning and we can just have that happen for her. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Actually, I haven't seen that mentioned anywhere, but that would see like a natural progression of this work smart productivity tracking tool. Oh, it's big. Yeah. A lot of companies are using it. So this always begs the question. That'll be uh, more fun here than the other ones. You know, what would you like to take forward and implement that ESW and Joe Lamont are using? Honestly, I, I do think it makes sense. If I like the idea of looking at companies that are more established, like I, and I, this wasn't a, a conclusion you made out of your notes. Like this wasn't your conclusion. The thing I'm teasing out of it is like, and I, we should go through these companies. I think that'd be a good follow-up thing for me to do is look up some of these companies and see when did they get bought and what happened to their product afterwards. My guess is it doesn't change significantly. There's not a big investment. Does that make sense to do to companies or to as a trans, transaction for us to look at? As I look at Blinksell, that's what was happening here. It's a 10-year-old company. It's not really having anything happen to its product. And there's a minimal tech team and we're able to build new things with less pieces. It, it's not innovating. We're doing all the innovation now, but it hasn't changed. You could accept a credit card or PayPal and, or, or nothing, or just a paper invoice, or paper check. So I, I think about, is that a better profile versus companies that are actively growing, actively iterating and actively in metamorphosis? I guess to simplify my takeaway from this is, do we want to look at companies that are more stable or do we want to look at companies that are still in a growth phase? So what's tough is the companies still in a growth phase come at a, a significant premium. And you mm -hmm. basically, with that acquisition price, betting that growth is going to continue. So you'd really have to look at the market and determine what is the growth factors there. Most of these folks do not deal with those companies. Vista Equity and... Uh, John Blank, another one, but Vista Equity and one others are the only people that really attack these, you know, quick growing companies and are confident enough that they could grow them faster than they're currently growing. Yeah. How about you? What do you, what are you taking away from this guy? Uh, my biggest thing is I love how he puts processes in place for everything. And it's something that I think about where I do a lot of stuff over and over, and I maybe don't put in standing operating procedures often enough. Where I could systematize everything of the first calls with founders. I it maybe coming from the venture capital world where it's more like a discussion. I don't think it really has to be like it should be more of like a rubric or something that you're filling out. And I should probably be more systematized with that stuff and probably start handing it off to more people, VAs or whatever, and trying to scale that up. That was probably my biggest takeaway from the whole thing is thinking more of like how could this be quantified more so than the you know qualitative stuff that I'm doing. Interesting. Yeah, I've seen some stuff online, mainly on Twitter, like people's accounts, people that are really good at that. And I, when I see like checklists for every little thing, and, and we talked to somebody on the formulated podcast about this or, uh, around automation, somebody that was all they do is just capture and turn them into playbooks. Like they have these playbooks and then it's very easy to then turn them into automation, which is what we talked about. But I've seen some of these playbooks. It's just, I get so much envy. I was like, I wish I was that organized. I, I just wish that, oh, I have this meeting and I pull this playbook or better yet, I could just hand this to someone else or you could do it. If I'm not available, anyone can have the power because they know how to run the meeting or what steps to take or just checklists. It's just, it's such an ideal state. And I'm so far, from, <laughs> I'm so far from it. I, I would say it's like being a seasoned pro though. Like when you really know something, you don't have to think about like how to run or, or do, you know, some certain task, you know, or complex task, but it's so much easier to spin people up and even refine and be more intentional about things when it's written out. So I couldn't agree more about that. I, I didn't pull that away from it, but it's, I like it. 
But that's like his whole thing is he was when he's scolding all is, is you're requiring too many people that are like super smart, jack of all trades. Mm-hmm. And you just have to break everything down into like smaller, specialized mm-hmm. work units. And it's something that I, I think about too, is like trying to scale this up. You can't be doing everything. You can't require everyone involved to be like, you know, super smart, super versatile. You got to start putting in like specialists at some point. And he's but, the master of it, probably the best of anyone we've looked at. That comes at a cost though right? To delegate or leverage out work for every person you add, there's a communication cost. And the same thing with like microservices and coding. You can break up software systems and now you have to have a really complex thing, which is like a message bus or in the, going back to the analogy of just having a person, you now have the emails that go between you. And so now you have to have a really good, like collaboration system. And so I agree though, you have to have that. It's so much infrastructure that as you start to add it, you're like, ah, Email doesn't work for this. I need to have a conversation with four people to do one task. So yeah, this is a great way to do it efficiently and cost-effectively, but then the, the conversation overhead, and I can see how when, you, I think you met this software called Work Smart. So I wonder like having a tech enabled operating system figured out, whether that's something you build or you just have a low code or no code stack of, hey, we just use Roam and whatever. I think this is what everyone is envisioning like the, office software world like notion is trying to become because uh i think everyone would see that that ideal state of hey we can work less we can work smarter and we can get more done and spread the work around to more people that's actually a cool idea of distributed workforces so i don't know probably a lot of buzzwords and corporate strategy built in there but i can see it i can see why you'd want to do that and especially for a structure like we're working on where there's just a lot of like stuff you got to do, talking to people, contacting people, outreach and and whatnot. Yeah. I think if you believe that all software does taste like chicken, like this assembly line style is the natural endpoint, And it's, you've got to get to a more stable equilibrium point to do that kind of thing. If things are still changing, things are growing really quickly. You aren't there yet, but it, it works for the businesses that they're buying. Yeah. Going back to the granularity of tasks, like I... I think that, that I'm just trying to think I spend my time, I'll do something, a task once. And, and once I do it twice, I'm like, you know what, I'll start to record it. And then I just never take the time to do it. And I think that's a good resolution pulling out of this conversation is I'm going to start doing that in you know, an hour a week, an hour a day or something of just review the tasks. So maybe I need to download WorkSmart. Maybe I'm getting converted to the software, <laughs> but it, it would be great to just record my day. And if it was easy to sort through, be like, okay, what did I do? What can I automate? I think that's actually, that's my new, I'm changing my takeaway. This is my new takeaway, which is basically your takeaway. So I guess, I guess if you want to see it, I'll embed this in the show notes. It's at colinkeely.com. Otherwise I'll probably add a few more things and then I'll set it live when this podcast goes live. Fantastic. Good work. I great research. Uh, thanks. Yeah, this is a fun one. It's definitely a learning experience, but anyway, take care everyone. Thanks for listening.